<laughs> so uh, um, just to, just to well, maybe not even finish off, but just to proceed with that. So fast forward a few years and you ended up recording with Ed. Well, yeah, what happened was, um, uh, yeah, I, I just, well, I worked my ass off like we all have. And I remember lifting some solos and I don't, do you have perfect pitch? No. Well, I, no, I don't either. I mean, some, in a while. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I tell my students perfect pitch really means that you can steal everybody else's stuff a lot faster. Yeah, look, yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. But no, I used a reel-to-reel uh, tape recorder. I transferred the vinyl to tape and just sat there literally with the tape recorder, you know, play. Oh, that's not it. Stop. Rewind. Yeah. yeah. Play. Oh, that's not it. You know, and I did this for like months. I was obsessed. Right. And I lifted a few of his solos here. And I lifted enough to sort of be able to understand uh, like sort of some of the inner workings of, of uh, what he was thinking. Not he wasn't thinking, but I mean some of his logic. Sure. His own unconscious internal okay. logic. Uh, and I was able to take it and apply some of the voicings and ideas to other songs. Right. As opposed to say, you know, go to a session and say, hey, let's play Just Squeeze Me, and then sit there and play his solo. <laughs> well, like, well, it's a great solo, but... Maybe I should come up with, you know, maybe, sure. you know, we all have to do that. But yeah. that's, a, that's a stage that we all go through, you know, emulating your idols. And I, I think certainly, so. I, I, yeah. When I was much younger, I wanted to lift a lot of Eric Clapton stuff. I thought it was great at the time because I, well, I was a rock and roll guitar player. Yeah. You know, and then, okay. you know, things moved on and I was getting tired of the rock blues thing. And, I, and then I heard Ed and, and many other things. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, I just worked really, really hard. And then I started getting called to do some gigs around town. And that was back when the scene was smaller, there were a few players, and there were lots of gigs. So it was, for me, it was just the right place at the right time. So a lot of times, if Ed couldn't make a gig, I got called. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, so I was like learning, I was learning in the trenches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, playing with all kinds of people at these clubs. And sometimes they'd have charts, and other times they'd come in, which was smart, with a list of tunes. Or right. they'd say, do you have a list of tunes? Most of them were very generous and very kind. They, they see, saw this long-haired guy with a Les Paul thinking like, <laughs> oh, here we go. This is a jazz gig. You know, what's going to happen? Okay. But so I you did a record Paul with by. Johnny Hartman, and I showed up to the studio. It's like early 80s, right? I showed up, and I had like really, really long hair. I looked like Robert Plant or something. <laughs> and I had these aviator like prescription glasses and a Les Paul. Right. I can imagine the look on Johnny Hartman's face. Yeah, right. Like, who the f who, who is this person? <laughs> you know? But it worked out quite well. Uh, anyway, and then one thing led to another. And then um, somebody came up with an idea. At, uh, they had a concert series at this place called Harper's and they, uh, on Sunday nights. The person phoned me up who was booking it. Would you like to do a quartet with Ed Bickert? Wow. It's the Pope Catholic. Yeah, right. You know, so I went and, and we just winged it. I mean, I can't imagine how it's, I'm, I know how he sounded. I can't imagine how I sounded. But he was, he was aware of you, though. Well, yeah, he actually, because I already had that Pablo record out. And he came to my yeah. house to rehearse with my roommate for some gig. And Ed, in typical fashion, a man of few words, said, uh, Oh, I kind of like that Pablo record you did. It's, it's a great record. It's quite good. Yeah, it was. I was 26. We did it in like five or six wow. hours one day. You know, in hindsight, it would have been nice to have a couple of days, but that's how they did stuff. It's right? a great time. Record. You know, time is money too. You know. Anyway, we wound up doing a bunch of gigs, playing at this George's place, and then uh, a businessman started a record label in Toronto that was short-lived, and he had this uh, great idea. He wanted to record different people, and and one of the groups he wanted to record was the Quartet. With, with Neil on bass, right. who, who played last night, who I've known forever, and Jerry Fuller, a great drummer that's not around. Long story short, we went into the studio one day again, did a record. It was just vinyl and cassette. Right. You can't find it anymore. And then a few years later, I talked to Carl Jefferson, who was in Toronto for another recording session. And I said, um, you know, Concord Records was originally like all guitars before they branched out. But right. It was very guitar oriented, you know, Barney Herb. You know, it's good to hear that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that label's gone. It might have been bought up, and maybe they've got some reissues. But I said to, to uh, he said, oh, I really like that record you did with that. I said, oh, thank you. I said, would you be, maybe be interested in, he said, I'd like to record you guys sometime. And I thought he was just an offhand remark. And I, I said, really? He says, yeah. So I talked to Ed, and I said, hey, Ed, uh, I was just talking to Carl Jefferson for a minute. And he said that if he'd like to record us, so he said, if, if you're into it, he'd be into it. I said, I'm into it. Right. He says, yeah, I reckon. 
And then we did the Concord record. <laughs> That's six years later. Though. And this we went, is... 85 was the, the original. So it, um, uh, my version, is, my, my copy of this, I think it's got two different names. It's, it's called the, uh, the Quartet of... Well, that's the original one. Oh, that's the original yeah, one. And then the Concord one was called right. This Is New. Yeah, This Is New. Yeah, that's that was, right. I think, 1990. The uh, the one with the where Ed was facing one direction, that was for contract purposes. Right, right. He couldn't be, his face couldn't be on the front cover. Oh, so really? Ted O'Reilly, who helped produce <laughs> it, this, this great uh, ex-radio DJ in Toronto. Well, it was, it was because of that record that I got in touch with you, in fact, wasn't it? Because I'd, I'd, I'd heard... Um, your version of uh, Morning Star. Oh, right, and, yeah. And, and, and I was trying to figure out the chords, and, and I couldn't find yeah. it anywhere. You know, there's a great record. The only recording, I mean, other than the one we did that I re well, that's not true, actually. Uh, maybe uh, maybe Stan gets recorded, I can't remember. In any event, the one recording that, that I was aware of prior to the thing that we did was uh, uh, Hubert Law's record yeah. of yeah. the same name. I bought it. Yeah. CTI. It's yeah. a lovely recording. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, and I remember I've still got it somewhere. Uh, Ed, Ed scratched it out for me. Okay, yeah. By hand, yeah. and I've got a, a photocopy. Of it. Not yeah. that it's going to be like a, in the... You sent it to me. so I did, Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. I found it. I was looking for it forever because somebody, a, a band I play with in Toronto, the drummer wanted to play that tune. And I, I lost it and I found it. It's a tough tune, man. Yeah. Right. Well, I find it tough. No, really. it's very tough. Where those chords going down. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like, what the, what the hell do I play here? Yeah. You know. Well, but, you know, you, uh, the, bit, the best thing to do, because it's a pedal point, is to just like think about what the upper part is. Like if it says D sure. over B flat, just concentrate. In order to make that chord sound right, you play off what the triad represents, you know, and then kind of... Don't ask me to play it. I can't remember No, it. no, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> I, I played it fairly, sort of played it fairly recently. But then, and I started working with that a lot around town. And then... Uh, then I start, you know, I started uh, playing with other players, you know, word of mouth, you know, right. you know the story. And then I played with this trombone player, and that led to meeting Oscar Peterson because I was playing with this great trombone player, Butch Watanabe, from of Japanese descent, but uh, grew up in Montreal. Right. Was a childhood friend of Oscar's. We were playing at this club, and one night Butch said, "Hey, OP's coming in tonight." I went, "Oh my God!" <laughs> Looking what? for a hole in the ground. And he came and he heard us play a couple of tunes, one of which was uh, Hogtown Blues, which was from his Canadiana suite or something. Okay. Anyway, met him. He was very gracious. A couple of months later, he phoned me out of the blue. Would you like to do a record for Pablo? Oh, my I God. I talked to Norman. He had Norman Grants. Norman Grants came up to visit him or something. So Norman, uh, it, was, it was amazing because phone rings. Hello, Lauren? Yes, this is Oscar Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> I almost fell over. I bet you did. You know, I mean, I was like, uh, I don't know, I guess 25 at the time. And he said, uh, are you signed with a label? I said, no. <laughs> and he said, I've got Norman Granz right here. Do you want to talk to him? I went, of course. And Norman Granz, who was just, he came up to Canada to visit him because he was his manager, you know. Right. And he said, well, you know, Oscar says you're a pretty good player and I'll take his word for it. And so they booked <laughs> a one-day recording session and that was the Pablo thing. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, one thing led to the another and that's, and then you know, I was really busy for a few years, and then the scene changed, you know, and then some other younger great players came up, and, sure, and sure. things just moved around. Can and we I, can we just go back to uh, Oscar yeah. Peterson for a second? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've got that record, and it sounds great, and you really sound like your own man on there. I mean, well, it was did you feel that, there, but, you did know. you feel any kind of pressure because obviously you you know who's kind oh, of shoes you're filling, you know? It's, oh God, yeah, yeah. But I'm you know managed to. Uh, you know, managed to lay something down. So. Ha, it was great. No, but you know, the adrenaline kicks in. And, you know, it's sort of, it's like, it's sort of like survival chops or something, you know. I mean, we've all been there. Oh, yeah. You're in a situation and, and if for whatever reason, it's, it's, you think it's, we imagine or it's challenging. In reality, it's challenging or we make it challenging because we get up, to, you know, we start thinking about, oh, well, what, what, you know, yeah, what yeah. happens if I... You know, if I don't play well or, or whatever, <laughs> does you that know, we all have a tendency to sort of catastrophize things. Of sometimes. course, of course. I, I I find the way personally that it, yeah. it, it affects me is that it, it makes me kind of grip the guitar a bit tighter and maybe my timing goes a bit. Yeah. I mean, but you always seem to well, remain no, really well, I, yeah, it's, calm. It's, well, I know. Under I try and shut my eyes and try and get into this. I wasn't. I mean, I, I yeah. I mean, I have my moments where. I don't play as well. I never play as well as I'd like to. But we, we all of us, it's part of the human condition. I guess so. You know, you're in a situation that for some reason it's its uncomfortable or we make ourselves feel uncomfortable. Yeah. I yeah. mean, really, we're sort of the ones that generate um, the tension. 
Yeah. In, in, mo in most cases. Yeah. Sometimes you can play with people and they've got attitude and, and you know, they make, well, maybe it's an ego thing on their part too. Like sometimes, you know, you know, if people are insecure for it, for whatever reason, they tend to sort of deflect it and, and lay it on someone else. Right. In whether it's music or anything in life, you know. So it's a matter of sort of, um, you know, uh, trying to zero in as much as you can into the moment and into yeah. the sound. And that's yeah. why I love yeah. to play with my eyes shut. Right. Because then there's really, there's less distractions. Yeah. There's, there could still be a little bit of noise up here. But you know, you try and, <laughs> you, you know, you try and turn it That's back. a good word, noise. Yeah. It does get in the way. Yeah, it, it does, yeah, for, yeah. for sure. I mean, and it happens to everybody. And sometimes you'll be playing at a club and it's noisy. And you're trying to play and, you, and then all of a sudden you're hearing about something completely inconsequential, like, a, you know, either a few feet away or several feet away or, and it's, um, <laughs> it breaks the flow. Sure. You know, yeah. and it, that's and you know playing in nightclubs, it's a hard thing. I'm really, I, I'm, I'm much better. Uh, I can dial all of that now. I'll be out with my wife in a restaurant, and they'll play like some kind of horrid music, and she says, "Oh, the music here is horrible." And I say, "Like, I, I'm just ignoring it." I mean, I hear it, but I, you know, unless it's really loud, then yeah. I ask the staff to turn yeah, it down. Yeah. But, do you think? Um, do you think the 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 behavior of crowds has got worse over the years? Is it, you know, I mean, sometimes I see like video, like older videos. It like, I mean, there's some, some stuff of Ed Bickett, like the black and white stuff, mm -hmm. with Don Thompson, mm -hmm. and everyone is just absolutely silent. The reverent, reverent, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I've noticed in Europe, all the gigs that we played, every single one of them, was an absolutely like dedicated listening Great. crowd. That's really good to hear. Yeah, it was fantastic. It's not, it's not always like. No, that. I know. But the other thing too is a lot of jazz gigs are are played. You know, they're played in, in you know in pubs or you know bars, uh, where <coughs> excuse me. People want to go out and have a good time. Yeah, yeah, and um, they want to be able to talk. Yeah, well, I, I guess if you if you listen to like a you know Waltz for Debbie or something like that or or, no. or, or whatever. Yeah, the Vanguard. Yeah, I mean, oh. there's, there's people, yeah, <coughs> clinking glasses and all sorts there. It's, yeah. fun, it's incredible, isn't it? Really. Still and the kind of music that was being made. Yeah. That was classic. So, um, at some point, mm. you've you've um, you've ditched your your trusty Les Paul and you've moved. Well, that on. was years ago, yeah. Right. No, no. I mean, obviously years ago. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but, but so, did you move straight over to the Roadstar? Pretty much, yeah. Right. Yeah. By so why way. why did you choose a solid body? Guitar? You know, it was, well. It's just just by the um, the way my musical journey started. Was it something to do with Ed's telecaster? No, nothing. No, no. Right. I, I um, you know, I was a child of the '60s. So, uh, and I said I was into the Beatles and yeah. and uh, you know rock and pop. Sure. <clears throat> and that was primarily played on these kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and. Um, and I got, you know, I got into Zeppelin and Hendrix and Cream, and that was almost like solid body guitar music, you know, blues based. Sure. And it just stayed. With, and I, and I, my ears are used to that sound. Yep. Um, I like, I like it with. I mean, that guitar sound. Those guitars are beautiful. I mean, all, everybody makes different guitars work. Sure. You know, and it depends on what you're used to. But yeah, yeah. Because of my, like the journey that I was on and I'm still on. I, I. This feels like home to me. Yeah, sure, of course. And this guitar, there was, there's a great store in Toronto called the 12th Fret. And I went in there like, you know, 30 plus years ago. And the other guitar, which was my sort of number one guitar, was just hanging on the wall. I didn't, I wasn't looking to buy a guitar. It was just, you know, like this on the wall. Yeah, and, yeah. and I went up and I grabbed it. And <clears throat> first thing I noticed was the neck felt so great. Right. And it had light strings, but I didn't care. I just like, I like the, I've got small hands. And I like the fact that the neck is, you know, it's not too wide right. and it's not too fat on the other side. Is it short scale? Or? Yeah. Oh, no, this is a fender scale. Right. Yeah, this yeah, one, yeah, yeah, which is slightly longer. But anyway, I said, how much is it? And they said, oh, it's I don't know, like 235 bucks or something. And I said, well, <laughs> I'll take it. There you go. And it sounded, I mean, I, I, I plugged it in and I didn't like it because the pickups, as I said earlier, they were very, very low output right. and, and quite noisy because single coil. Right. And then, and then, not too long after, my student at York, he had this, that Pacifica guitar with one of these in it. And I really, I liked the sound, I played it. So I went to my local music store, and I got all three pickups changed. With some, and what are these things? These uh, Seymour Duncan Cool Rails. Cool yeah. Rails. Yeah. You know, if somebody asked me now, I'm looking for a new pickup to use, I wouldn't know what, I'm not into gear. You know how I many, there's so many different boutique, hand-wired. Yeah. yeah. 
I would just say, I don't know, I use Cool Rails and I really like them. Yeah, and yeah, Seymour yeah. Duncan makes, makes all kinds of different pickup configurations. Yeah, yeah. So check them out. It's a strange thing, isn't it? Like, you know, people, people try and sell you a pickup, but, but the, with words. And oh, yeah. words just cannot describe well, of course sound. Not. Yeah. It's just, there's no way. It's but like it's, someone describing a movie and, and you go, well, it sounds like I've already seen it now. I'm not going to, you know. <laughs> you know, you go in and see it and really experience it. And it's, you know, it's a very similar kind of a yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, while we're there, you've got a secret weapon as well, haven't you? What's that? Um, you've got your mid boost. Oh, yeah. But you know what? I only use it when it's... I use it at a quieter volume. Because if you crank it up and turn on the mid boost, it's such a noticeable difference in the yeah. gain. Also, it's battery driven. It's yes. active. So if the battery's even a little bit low and you hit it hard, it tends to overdrive sure. the amp a little bit. It gets kind of crunchy, and yeah. I don't like that sound. Yeah. I like it as clean as possible. I, I, hands up, I'll, I'll totally admit that I had exactly that put in my other guitar. Oh, well, no, they're fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, like, like at lower volume, it thick, thick and, like, here's the difference. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that well, that's full up. Here, hang on. Yeah, and then you can you can dial it in. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So that's uh, that was your influence on me. You've made me uh -huh. spend hundreds of pounds on it. Is that what it was? <laughs> well, I, I ordered it from from uh, it's it's uh, is it Demeter? Demeter, yeah, Demeter, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or is that US? I don't even know where it comes from. Uh, I, I think I think it was I think it was yeah yeah. And um, so I got it to the shop and um, got the guy to put it in and it wasn't working. And he said, I've got one here anyway. <laughs> so I didn't have to order it from the States. Oh. But anyway, so it's well, fine. <clears throat> but it's it's cool. And and, and sometimes if you, if uh, I've used it, with, like when you turn up and the amp's not doing quite what you want, it's just another option, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, option, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's another way of getting a little bit more sound out of the instruments. Or, yeah, 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 yeah. So, but yeah, as I said, I don't use it very often, but yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, do you want to play another tune, or you want to talk about some other stuff, or I mean, no, I'm up for anything. Maybe we should. Maybe we should play. Okay. You want to play something in three four? Okay. Emily. Uh, okay. Okay. Sure. Uh, what key do we? C. Yeah, that's fine. Is that yeah. One? yeah.
Fun. We ought to get a gig sometime. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>